Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. E tō mātou matunu i te rangi i kawe nei mātou a pono koropiko na tūi ni mātou i mūtou araro tapu. E tuku atu ngā whakawhita i ngā whakamui mi te tanga kia koe te matua mau manaki tanga. Horohia tō koroi aroha tō koroi manaki tō koroi chaki ki runga hoki tēnei whakamenenga. A rātou ko tāmei ki te whakarongo ki tēnei tō tātou rangatira. Nō rere te matua, koe tēnei hoki mātou i nō te akoe. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us now and forevermore. Amen. Kia tau, kia tātou katoa, ti āta whai o te tātou wariki a i hukraiti, me te aroho te atua, me te whiwhinga tahitanga ki te wairua tapu. Ake, 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 amen. Kia ora tātou. Mai, nau mai, hara mai. Hara mai ngā manuhiri, hara mai ngā tini whanaunga. Hara mai, koutou, ki te whakarongo, ki tēnei tō tātou rangatira nei. Nō reira, hara mai. Hara mai, hara mai, whakatau mai rā. A tēnā koutou a tātou tini mate. A rātou ko hinga mai, ko hinga atu runga marai maha. Ko te kōrero mo koutou i te hunga wairua, haere atu, haere atu, whakawati atu. A hoki mai ki a tātou hoki ngā waihotanga rātou mā nō reira huri noa, huri noa. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, ai tēnā nō tātou katoa. Nō reira huri tū ki tēnei tō tātou rangatira. A mihi atu kia koe, e tā. Haere mai koe ki roto i ngā puhi, a ki rote te tai toka rau. Hono ke tā mai hoki i te maho o e nei ki te whakarongo i ākoe. Me ngā kupu i pāna ki te hau ora. Nō rira haere mai. Haere mai me tō horangatira. A ti awa. Nō rira ngā ti toa. Haere mai koutou a kohurua ki roto te tai tokarau ki roto i ngā puhi. Ngā ti whātua. Ngā maho ki ngā iwi, ngā hapu ki roto o i tēnei tā tātou wahi. Haere mai. Haere mai. Whakatau mai rā. Nō reira tātou mā, ka mihi atu ki a koutou, nō reira huri noa, huri noa, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā nō tātou katoa. Tui!
Apiti hono tātai hono te hunga wairua ke te hunga wairua. Ko rātou e whetuana ki te ao tūroa. No reira mihi atu koukou tū, haere atu, haere atu whakoti atu. Apiti hono tātai hono ko tātou hoki ngā waihotanga rātama. Huri noa, huri noa, te nā koutou, te nā koutou, te nā koutou, te nā tātou katoa. Tui, 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 tui e runga, tui e raro, tui e waho, tui e roto. Tui te heranga tangata, ka rongo to pō, ka rongo to au, homi e, hui e, tā heki e. Tuatahi, e te minita, te ihi, mō tō karakia, mō tō mihi, tēnā koe, tēnā koe, tēnā koe. Rā ranga tira mā, kua tai mai nei, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Te ranga tira o tēnei whare, te ranga tira o te konihira o whangarei te ringa parawa, Cheryl, tēnā koe, tēnā koe, tēnā koe. Nā kai hoi o te waka o huora o te taitokarao. Ko tai mai nei. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko tai mai nei, he kotuku reringatahi. Mātua tā Mason. Koroa whaia arohia. Tēnā koroa, tēnā koroa, tēnā koroa. Nō mai hairi mai, piki mai, whakato mai ki te ki te whangarei te ringa parawa, te kopapa o tēnei ahi-ahi pō, te kopapa o maramatanga. It's a privilege to stand yet again, as I do year after year, as we come to the recognition of Te Tirito Waitangi in our country, to welcome you, our friends, to this very special event. I particularly tonight want to tātoko the words of our kaumātua, Te I Tito, a.k.a. Stevie Wonder, in acknowledging our esteemed guests tonight. It was probably about eight years ago that we started this round of acknowledging the Tariti of Waitangi in our country by pre-Waitangi symposium, and we've had some incredibly esteemed guests and that year we invited Sir Mason. And the next year we invited Sir Mason. And the next year, <laughs> next year. But we never give up. And that's the moral of the story. Never give up. Because um, Sir Mason and Lady Arahia are going to Dunedin the day after tomorrow. But they've decided to come to Dine go to Dunedin via Whangarei. <laughs> because after eight years... So this is a very special welcome. Um, Sir Mason and Lady Aura here drove up today, drove up from Fielding to be with us. Um, so your presence is incredibly welcomed and acknowledged, but you're getting here tonight and how and what it has meant. We honour you and we really deeply thank you. Many people, even though we've been around for some time, still wonder what a PHO is or what Manaya PHO is or does. But um, it's one of the things we do is we relate and we know you and everybody here is our friends. So we really do acknowledge you all as our friends tonight. And, and it's just a joy to see you 
and to celebrate something that's very dear to all of us. I particularly acknowledge a special friend who's here tonight, and that's the Mayor of Whangarei, Cheryl Mai. Uh, it's her home, her house, so it's good to be here. And so um, I acknowledge you, Cheryl, and thank you for being here tonight. In order to perhaps somehow explain what we do um, as a PHO, I think you'd, you need, if you live in Northland, you can understand it because Northland is a place of great beauty, both of the earth and what and how we, what's around us on the earth, but also when we look up into the sky. And I think we see the stars here as bright as anywhere um, in, a, in a good, clear night, the beauty of the stars. And in this... As, as you look at that sky and you see those stars, it reminds me of the stars who make up the fabric of health in Northland. So many stars. So many wonderful bright lights. Organisations and individuals doing wonderful things. And many of you are here tonight. And many of you are connected with us. And... If you get up very early in June and July um, and look towards the east, you see something very special, and that's Matariki. And when you look at Matariki, first of all, it looks like just one blob of light, bright light. Put on the binoculars or telescope, and you see it's made up of individual stars. But somehow they, can, they seem to be connected. They seem to be joined up. It's the beauty of Matariki. And I think what we are doing, we're seeing more of today, is the joining up of the stars that make up the sky of health in Taitokarau. Individually, we are bright and we do wonderful things, but collectively, we can, make, we can light up the whole sky. And I think we're learning more now that what we can do collectively is so much better than what any of us can do individually, no matter how good we are. And I think we have a small role to play in that connecting of the stars. Many of, you, of the stars are here this evening. And just to, to give you an idea of the fabric, just to show who's here tonight, we have our, our colleagues from the Northland District Health Board, from North Haven Hospice, from Learning Edge. There are dental carers here. There are people representing our 22 general practices who are the backbone of primary health care in Northland. We have people from Youth Justice, students from the Pukawakawa program for fear um, medical students. We have people from He Punamarama Trust, Te Timi Tatanga, Cancer Society, Anglican Care, Ringa Atafai, Open Polytech, Te Taitokoro PHO, the many rest homes of Whangarei, Nati Hini Health Trust, Staff Care, Odyssey Health, House, Kindergartens, Child, Youth and Family, Idea Services, our pharmacies, Te Ha Oranga o Nati Fatua, the newest star in the sky, Octane Youth Health, which was opened only last Saturday, SOS, Plunkett, and at the other age of the other end of the spectrum, Age Concern. Hokianga Health, Tumaya Fano, Northland Regional Council, students from Auckland University and Massey University, Dargavo Hospital, Teho Ora o Kaikoi, Pikiaki Development, North Tech, Addiction Services in Kaitaia, and many of our counsellors, plus many friends. And you just make up a fraction of the stars that make up the health fabric of Northland. So this as well as acknowledging the role of the treaty, it's also acknowledging our role. If you stand here on the road at the moment over the last few days, you've seen many, literally waka, being towed up to Waitangi on the backs of trailers from all over the motu as they assemble for the day after tomorrow. And today I noticed another lot of waka going up. They were crown cars. And uh, then there's other walkers, the Māori Party walker and the Mana Party walker and the ACT walker and the Labour walker. Now they're all there. They're all passing, Ooh, heading up for the annual event of Waitangi. 
And no doubt the television walkers are there and they'll be looking for a bit of the old, you know, heave-ho. They miss the real stuff, of course. But for us, the Treaty of Waitangi is not an annual event at all. In fact, we look at it and we go, oh, yeah, God, what's this, you know? Because for us, the Treaty of Waitangi is something we, we don't just do every year. It's something that we do every day. It's part of who we are. It's how we live and how we relate with each other. And with any relationship that's really worth its salt, any good relationship, it grows and it's organic. It has its ups and downs. Na heki na peki, as we're told. Um, but behind it all, there's deep commitment to keep working at it. And that's a pathway all of us in this room tonight are on. We're working at it. So it is a great privilege to actually welcome into our midst somebody who's given us energy to work at it, guidance, encouragement over many years. I don't have to introduce um, Tar Mason to you anymore because all of you know him. All of you have read, you've learned. He's no stranger in our midst. He's a friend, a colleague, and somebody we acknowledge. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome um, again Tar Mason. Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Kyoda Mayanutato. Otira, te taira, te taira, e pariana te taiki here, e pariana te taiki, te kohi ke komatua here to here to. Otira, te rangatira, te na koe, i i tau hoki te rangi maria te fakapono i wangino ya tata i te naipo a te na hoki ko e mihi mai fakatau mai ki amawa ko tata ka to ko tai mai ki te na o tata na ko papa a tahua a te na hoki ko e manaya haora a na ko te te reo pohiri te reo karanga a ko tai mai te katoa ki te na o tata na fare i te pono uh, thank you for the welcome, and uh, it's really great to be here at last. <laughs> uh, and uh, if those of you who are sitting behind the screen would find it easier to sit in front of the screen, there are some seats out the front there. But the, the, the credit for tonight really, I think, goes to Manaya Health. Uh, A, for initiating this series of uh, addresses, to commemorate an important occasion, but also to recognise their commitment uh, to the treaty and uh, to Māori health. There's really uh, only uh, four points I want to talk about tonight. Uh, unfortunately, it'll take me a while. <laughs> but the, the, the first one is that uh, this year is an important year. It's a celebration because in 1984, the relevance of the Treaty of Waitangi to modern times uh, was affirmed, and in that year the Hui Whakaoranga signalled a new era for Māori health. So that's the first point. We're into a, a new era is now 30 years old. Uh, since that time, there have been really substantial gains in Māori health, and I want to talk a bit about some of those gains. But the next 30 years will require different strategies from the last 30 years. And I want to discuss some of those. And really to conclude by looking at three broad, really broad aims that are important for health, that we should have healthy lives, Modi order, healthy whānau, healthy families, whānau order, and a healthy environment to live in, wai order. So there are the uh, four points. Thank you for coming. <laughs> 
Actually, I had uh, no idea before I uh, came in here tonight that there were this many people living in Whangarei. But, <laughs> but I, I mentioned earlier about uh, we're here largely uh, at the instigation of Manaya Health and to recognise the commitment of uh, Manaya Health to the Treaty of Waitangi a commitment that has uh, shown itself in a number of ways, the way that the organisation is governed. The goals of Manaya Health reflect also a strong treaty dimension. And so the PHO, I think, can uh, take pride in the fact that it has been a pioneering institution so far as recognising the treaty as relevant to health. That wasn't always the case. In... Uh, in the 19, it wasn't until the 1980s that people began to think about the treaty as being relevant not just to the distant past and not just relevant to land, but also relevant to the way we live, to health and to education. And so uh, it, it's uh, really quite recent in New Zealand's history that the broader dimension of the treaty has been reflected and it is well reflected in Manaya uh, Health. So in 1984, we, uh, this is a 30, uh, 30 years this year since 1984, and uh, really that was quite a defining year. Remember, it was a sudden change of government. Uh, the, those of you who uh, will have, some people struggle to remember 1984 because you were too young. And some of you will struggle to remember 1984 because you're too old and you can't, <laughs> can't remember it. <laughs> but but uh, it was a new era. There was a change of government, and the Muldoon government, which had been in power for some years, was replaced by the uh, Longy Douglas government. And quite early on, that government took a fairly bold step in saying that the Treaty of Waitangi is relevant to all New Zealand policies. That was a fairly new approach uh, in its time. And although it was never quite clear what it meant, and the government uh, struggled a bit, they did recognise that it was important beyond history and beyond land uh, issues. Uh, that was the year also that um, Maori leadership combined in a way that they had never combined before in order to produce some quite staggering results. Uh, that year, there were three hui held throughout the country. They were really they were national hui, uh, large. Uh, the first of the three was the hui Fago Oranga, which was held at the Horni Waititi Marae in March of 1984, and that was about health. It was the first national Maori health hui that had been held since 1907, so they don't come around that often, but. <laughs> They do now, but that was a, uh, important at its time. The second hui was uh, equally important. That was held in Ngarawahia in uh, September, and that was a hui called the Te Hui Mo Waitangi, where the discussion was expressly about the Treaty of Waitangi in modern times. And the third uh, hui was called the Hui Taumata, which was about looking at Maori economic development in the years ahead. So those, those three hui are really important, and uh, they, they, had, they were quite separately organised, but some very common themes emerged from the three of them. The two major themes were that if you're talking about Māori development, it has two arms to it. One is that Māori should be able to participate fully in society, in the economy, and in education. The other arm was that Māori should also be able to participate in te ao Māori, in the Māori world. Mm -hmm. So those two arms were both expressed at the three hui, uh, and there were four common goals that were identified in all, of, in all three of the hui. The first was that the aim should be self-management and self-determination. The days of being dependent on others, and especially dependent on the government, was not a way forward for Māori. And the second uh, common goal was recognising that Māori perspectives and Māori values were important in education, important in health, important in social services, important in economic development. And the, uh, the, the third of the fourth was that it's really important that Māori development has Māori leadership. 
And the, the final one, which came up uh, at, at all three who are quite independently, was that there is a treaty-based relationship with government. And that had not been expressed uh, in quite such terms before. So they were the four big uh, hui, that, the three big hui that were held, and the themes that emerged from them. Uh, what, what are the impacts? Uh, some things that would, uh, the hui was aiming for were realised. In 1985, for example, the Waitangi Tribunal was able to look at claims dating back to 1840. Before the hui, they had only been looking at claims dating back to 1870, uh, back to 1975. So that led to a huge rush of claims. Many of them have been settled. Oh, we're getting on up here, nearly settled. Huh? <laughs> uh, most, uh, by 1987, most government departments had established a Māori arm of some sort uh, or another. Sometimes it was done by having a Māori word, uh, sometimes by, <laughs> by having a Māori perspective, and sometimes by creating positions that were uh, specifically for Māori. Uh, in 1987, Māori became an official language of New Zealand. New Zealand's only got two official languages, as Māori is one, and sign language is the other. <laughs> English is spoken quite a lot, but it's never been declared an official language. <laughs> then, uh, in 1987, the Court of Appeal uh, made a, a, a very uh, revolutionary uh, decision in respect of the State-Owned Enterprises Act by ruling that the Act contradicted the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi, and the Court recommended that Māori and the Crown get together to sort it out. And that was a fairly novel step, which would not have occurred had not the, uh, the hui mo waitangi occurred, happened. 1983, the Māori electoral option was, was retained, despite quite a strong pressure to disestablish the Māori role. And in, uh, jumping forward a bit to 1993 also, the health reforms saw the emergence of a whole range of Māori health organisations and the incorporation of Māori perspectives into health services generally. Uh, in 2000, the year 2000, the health, uh, section four of the uh, Health and Disability Service Act was added. That's a section which requires district health boards to recognise the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi when they exercise their roles. And in 2013, uh, 64 treaty settlements had been concluded. Uh, since 1990, that was a, uh, qu quite a, compared with most countries, that's, that's a major step. And uh, in 1913, uh, the Tuhoi settlement uh, achieved some notice. But I really just want to spend a bit more time talking about the Hui Faka Oranga, which was the health Hui. And that was held at the Horni Waititi Murai. About 300 people arrived, uh, various uh, people. Some were represented from hospital boards, so the precursors of DHBs. Uh, others were Iwi leaders. There were quite a few health professionals there, uh, quite a lot of researchers. Uh, my health practitioners, iwi representatives. So it was a very broad hui, and although it was focusing on health, it was by no means limited to people who were working in health. The main themes that uh, came up at that hui were that uh, Maori health perspectives are important to health services and should be incorporated into health services, that the government health policies should recognise the position of Maori health, and actively seek to change that, that uh, disparity should be eliminated, and that Māori self-management should be a feature of health programmes. So they were, they were the main themes. Uh, at the, uh, there were a number of uh, people who have passed on who were really important contributors to that uh, hui. Uh, Nita Mapaiwai, uh, who was a general practitioner up here, was one of the participants at the hui. And Sonny Waru, who worked in Auckland but was from Taranaki, was another participant. I was on a panel with them, one on each side. They disagreed about just about everything, <laughs> but were both making really significant and important uh, statements. Dame Finna Cooper arrived in her wheelchair with a karamu branch and said this is uh, the beginning and the end of good health. Her message was much wider, don't forget the environment. Uh, 
uh, was her strength there. Paratene Ngata had been one of the people who organised the conference since uh, passed on. Uh, Ron Barker with the district, uh, who was the Director General of Health at the time, uh, played a key role. And uh, Raiha Mahuta uh, introduced the idea of Maori Health, talked about a, uh, the example of a Maori Health provider, which was novel in 1984. The, uh, when the hui opened, the, uh, the, the Minister of Maori Affairs at the time was a man called Ben Couch, great rugby player. Uh, and uh, the, the view he, took, he mentioned at the beginning of the hui was one that was quite common at the time, that there's no such thing as Maori health. Health is the same for everyone. We all have bodies which are similar. We all, well, not all, <laughs> but there's, there's, there are similarities, and the rules are the same. Eat well, sleep well, exercise, and observe moderation in all things. Well, by the end of the hui, that view of health had been rejected, uh, no one objected to eating well and sleeping a lot. <laughs> but the point uh, made at the hui was that if you want good health, the way you perceive health and the way you deliver health services has got to make sense to the people you're doing working with, which really meant that culture is critically important to a good outcome for health. So a number of recommendations from that hui. Uh, the first one, that health services uh, for Māori should reflect Māori values and perspectives, that Māori clinics uh, and community health programmes should be established according to local priorities. There, was one, there were two at the time. One was in Tauranga, and Tainui uh, had just started one. There's something like 250 Māori health providers now. There were two in 1984. Uh, Māori health workforce development was seen to be a really uh, important part of Māori health. And uh, as a suggestion was made to the Director General of Health that the funding for Māori health should be devolved to Māori. Uh, Professor Whatarangi Winyata said, uh, don't talk about what you're going to do, just give us the money and we'll do it. And the Director General said he would have to give that some thought. <laughs> And the, uh, the other point uh, recommended there was that health authorities by themselves are not able to deliver a good service and there was a recommendation for partnerships between health services, government funded ones particularly, and uh, Māori groups. So this is kind of all old hat, but in 1984 it wasn't and these were the recommendations that came out uh, 30 years ago. So really the, the hui whakaoranga signalled that uh, there was a new approach coming to looking at Māori health. It was less, a bit less about what shall we do for Māori and more about what can, how can Māori improve health. Well, um, what, what's been achieved? You, has, uh, was, was this hui largely uh, just talk or did it actually achieve something? Uh, what has been achieved since then? And to answer that question, you, you've really got to ask, well, what, is, what do we measure? If we want to know whether there have been changes, what, what are the things we should measure to say whether it's been a real change or no change? And uh, if there have been gains, where are they? What are the gains that have occurred? Well, there are two uh, really broad questions, and a lot of people are working on them now. But there is, it is possible to make some uh, progress in looking at them. First of all, the, the, there are a number of ways of measuring uh, gains in Māori health. The first one that is the most common one in this country is to measure Māori health against non-Māori health. That's the disparity approach. That uh, for every uh, illness, you look at what are the rates for Māori and what are the rates for other New Zealanders. And that's a legitimate way of doing it. And that's been the way we've relied on. The, the other way is not so much to measure Māori health against non-Māori health, but to measure Māori health over time. So what was health like in 1984? What's it like now? Rather than is it any different from non-Māori or not? And the other thing that uh, ne need to think about when trying to look at what has changed, do you measure adverse incidents, diabetes, 
rheumatic heart disease, motor vehicle accidents, or do you measure achievements? So uh, there are a number of questions about how you measure a gain, and uh, we've tended to rely pretty much on measuring disparities in this country. And you would know, you would know uh, uh, better than I that for almost every medical condition, my, the rates for Māori are two or three times higher for virtually every condition, except two. One is melanoma, not so common among Māori, and the other is anorexia nervosa. <laughs> So, so uh, if, you look at, uh, if you look at disparities, you can see that uh, if that is the measure, then there is room for concern, and we should be concerned about disparities. But uh, the gap is reducing in quite significant areas, cardiovascular disease, for example. But the other way is to look at the achievements. And what you see is that Māori cessation for smoking has never been higher than it is at present. And Northland leads the way. The <laughs> across the country generally, between uh, 2006 and 2013, uh, just on 30% of smokers stopped smoking. That was for the country generally. In Northland almost, uh, sorry, 23% nationally stopped smoking. For Northland, it was almost 30% stopped smoking. So that's a, uh, that is an achievement. And a large number of those people were people aged between 15 and 19. So that's, that's one achievement you might look at. The other one is to look at primary health care. Yeah, good health really depends on early intervention and what is, what is Māori participation in primary health care? Currently, it's higher than it's ever been, partly because of the way it's organised now, but partly because of people being more aware of health. That uh, infant mortality has been reduced, life expectancy has increased, and there's certainly much more awareness among Māori about health as an important issue. So they are some ways of measuring it. It's hard to say all of this was due to the hui whakaoranga, but and it wasn't. The hui whakaoranga, though, was a visible signal that things were going to change. Look, first of all, at population growth. And you see that, uh, that uh, between uh, 1800 and 1900, things were looking pretty grim. Uh, the population started out at about 200,000 in 18... That's a guess, by the way. Uh, the census in, in the year 1800 wasn't that accurate. Uh, the, the, by 1814, 1820, the missionaries had a way of doing it. They used to count the number of men in a war canoe and multiply it by four. <laughs> they, they figured that for every man in a war canoe, there were four others at home, either hoping he would return or hoping that he wouldn't return. <laughs> But that wasn't a very accurate uh, method either. Captain Cook had another way. Uh, he had a man on uh, his ship who was really good at counting people. And so every time the ship called uh, somewhere, he would do a quick count of the people, which wasn't that accurate, partly because it missed two hoi altogether. <laughs> and it missed two whare tō altogether. Because <laughs> they weren't visible on the coast. But... Uh, uh, Tarangi Hiro, who was a uh, prominent Māori anthropologist and medical practitioner, uh, his anthropological work suggests that it was about 200,000. Uh, by 1900, it was 45,000. So a really steep decline, probably due to uh, diseases that were, uh, for which there was no immunity. Uh, 4,000 people died of measles in 1854. So there was a very rapid decline. Muskets didn't help. No, the putty was one thing, muskets another. That didn't help. Malnutrition was pretty uh, severe as people moved from one form of diet to another. And if that red line had continued, uh, Māori would virtually have become uh, uh, lost by uh, 1935, 1940. It didn't. There was a reversal there, largely, I think, to Māori leadership. 
And so uh, it's been a slow increase and then a, a uh, rapid increase, so that at the census last year, uh, 598 people, uh, just on 600,000 Māori from 200,000 uh, 200, originally, and the projection is by 2050 uh, around about uh, eight to near, getting close to a million if you add all those ones who are living in Perth. <laughs> You've got, you've got a million people. So that's got to be uh, one of the great recovery stories of the world, uh, that here's a, a population look like it was uh, declining and moved up to uh, more than treble itself. Some of the, one of the problems is, is uh, this question of who is a Māori for statistical purposes. Uh, it always, uh, uh, up until 1813, uh, up till 1913, a Māori was said to be a person who was a half-caste or more than a half-caste. And there were two sorts of half-castes. There were half-castes who were living as Māori and half-castes who were living as Europeans. The half-castes living as Europeans were not regarded as Māori. So if you can imagine the census then, the census man would come around, call all the half-castes together and <laughs> figure out who their father was and then make a decision whether they were half-castes living as Māori or half-castes living as European. It wasn't hugely accurate. That was the, uh, the biological method, uh, the, the, which was dropped in 1984, largely because of an act passed by Machu Rata, who said, moved away from this biological method of determining your identity. The maths was a bit hard for some people, but if your mother was three-eighths and your father was five-eighths, you've got to add it together, divide it by two, <laughs> and figure out who you were, and that was... Uh, <laughs> That was uh, uh, problematic for, the, for the, a lot of people. So it didn't become very accurate because people just used to write down FB, full-blooded. Uh, so, but now we have another way. A, a Māori now is defined as a person who is descended from a Māori. That's, uh, that's one method. That's called the descent method. The other one is a person who identifies as Māori and is descended from a Māori. And there's a gap of about 80,000 people who are descended but don't identify as Māori. Although that gap varies. They call them the intercensus hoppers. They, <laughs> one census they're Māori, next census they're not Māori. <laughs> when the Ngaitahu settlement went through, big shift to, uh, <laughs> to being Māori. So that... Um, but uh, so what I'm, what I'm showing you there is the ethnicity data of people who identified as Māori. There was, there was a politician in Wellington uh, whose children were Māori, and she was making a case, and she introduced a bill to Parliament to say that if your children are Māori and the parents not, the parents should be able to define herself or himself as Māori. Um, on the view, of course, that if the, the family that votes together stays together. <laughs> uh, that would have meant a, a different sort of definition of a Māori. You would have had to say a Māori is a person who is descended from a Māori or who anticipates becoming an ancestor of a Māori. <laughs> but uh, the, the, that, one, that one, Parliament didn't uh, go, take that one any further. So... Uh, now we have these two definitions of ethnicity, and most health statistics are based on the ethnic identity, so that people who identify as Māori. The median age uh, for Māori is uh, 23.9. That means half the population is older than that and half the population is younger than that. That's a youthful uh, population. I'll talk a bit about that later. Uh, in most developed countries, the median age is somewhere between 35 and 40. And for New Zealand as a whole, the median age is around about 37. So you can say Māori are a youthful population because they have a low uh, median age. Uh, but uh, as well as that, the population is slowly getting older. There are more older people now than there were in 1984 and there's certainly more older people than there were in 1900. The, the uh, biggest subgroup population increase is in the 65 and over among Māori, which is good news because it means there'll be a lot of uh, older people around to balance the energies of the younger people. 
but the uh, population under 15 will continue to grow because there is a younger population. And, uh, but it's getting, a, it's getting smaller as the older population gets larger. Northland's got the highest proportion of older Māori, 7.7% uh, 7 .7 of Māori in the Northland area are over are 65 or over, compared with the national average, which is about 4%. And uh, Tasman, that's at uh, the top of the South Island, has got the highest proportion of young Māori, 13% under the age of 15. The other change is life expectancy, which is quite a good measure of the health of a people. And uh, in uh, 1900, the uh, life expectancy for Māori was 30 year, 33 years. Men could expect to live to 33, women could expect to live to 30. At the census last year, uh, a Māori male uh, can expect to live to 72.8 years and a Māori female to 76. It's not the same as the non-Māori, but if you compare it even just with 1984, you can see that there has been a significant increase in Māori life expectancy. For men, it's gone from 65 to 72, nearly 73, and for women, it's gone from 69 to 76. So a really significant shift in life expectancy. Disparities still exist. Um, but what's important has been that there has been a change. In demographic terms, that's a fairly rapid change in uh, increasing life expectancy. By 2026, uh, uh, Māori over the age of 65 will make up 8.5% of the Māori population. At present, 4.1%. The other change that's happened since the Hui Fokka Orang, since 1984, has been a greater awareness of health. Health has become an important issue. Uh, just about every iwi in the country has a health programme, and if they don't, certainly health is on the agenda. In 1984, health was on the agenda of one iwi, or two iwi, one in, in Bay of Plenty and uh, in Tainui. And the feeling was that Māori really are going to focus on land, uh, but that has changed significantly, and so that all we now have a put huge importance on health. That's been a huge step, because if you're not aware of health and don't, const don't focus on it directly, hard to make things change. Uh, there have been also big practices, big changes on Marae of uh, health practices. Food has changed. Uh, there's, there's a different, um, I remember uh, Al, Al Mariah in the 1980s uh, was like, probably like most others in the country. Um, huge servings of uh, boil up and steam pudding and cream and trifle. And uh, I made the mistake of telling my auntie that that was unhelpful, that you should be serving lettuce and carrots. <laughs> so she tried it out. She put lettuce and carrots on the table, as well as all the other food. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the meal, she said, look, all the lettuce and carrot is still there. That proves you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but there have been real changes uh, on Moran. The other, the other change, is, and this was introduced uh, nationally at the Hui Whakao Oranga, was this notion of Maori health perspectives. Uh, they, they weren't kind of sort of uh, major shifts. What was important was to be able for Māori to identify with an understanding of health. If you've got a sense of understanding, you have a sense of ownership over health. So that people were beginning uh, with Māori health perspectives, whare tapawha, te whiki, were beginning to feel that they owned health and that health actually didn't belong to the doctors and the nurses uh, and the experts. It belonged essentially to them. And that was a really important shift in thinking. And uh, when the Māori Women's Welfare League undertook its major research program called Rapawara in 1984-1985, uh, 1985, published the results, the framework they used to analyse their data was based on Whare Tapawha, and that was, to my knowledge, the first time uh, that that had been done. The other big change, of course, has, has been that uh, the health sector generally has been hugely responsive uh, to Māori, 
uh, so that uh, cultural assessments have become part and parcel of the assessment process in a number of units and a number of centres throughout the country. Most uh, uh, DHBs and uh, PHOs have Māori managers, Māori community workers, Māori liaison officers. Ethnicity data is routinely collected now. It wasn't routinely collected uh, prior to 1984. The receptionist would have a guess, <laughs> and but would never ask. Um, the Ministry of Health and DHBs are now required to produce regular reports on health outcomes for Māori. So there is a, uh, an attempt to, uh, to measure the gains. And uh, practitioners tend to recognise now that Māori have expertise, may not have a medical or a nursing qualification, but have expertise which is useful to understand a, uh, a health situation. Uh, the other big change has been the growth in the uh, Māori health workforce, and that's been across the whole spectrum of professions, as well as with community health workers, uh, policy analysts, researchers, uh, health managers. There were none in 1984. There's now one in virtually every DHB, or more than one in every DHB, and, of course, the Māori health providers. The uh, medical scene has changed quite dramatically, if you look at it over uh, 100 years, in 1914 there were two Māori medical students at the University of Otago Medical School. That was 1% of the intake. And they were Te Rangihiroa, uh, Sir Peter Buck, and the other one was uh, Tūtere Wirepa, who went into general practice on the East Coast. They, they, were the, uh, they were the two who were there in that time. By 1964, uh, the number had increased to 10. That was about 2%. In 1913, last year, the number had increased to more than 250. And that now represents about 20% of all medical students. So that's been actually a huge change in uh, that Otago 137, Auckland 118. And that looks like it's, uh, it's uh, set to... And they're all, uh, all doing well, expecting uh, really high pass rates. Now, a number of uh, broad strategies. So the, by the way, the, the, um, almost every... I understand uh, there are now about 100 Māori pharmacists. There was one Māori pharmacist in 1984. The number of Māori psychiatrists has increased by 400%. Used to be two, now there's eight. <laughs> Uh, but uh, right across the board, in, in all professions, it's there. So this, this is not just, uh, not just the medical ones. The broad strategies for increasing the workforce are recruitment of the professions to uh, extend the workforce so that we now have cultural advisors, part of the health team, uh, community health workers, komatua, consumers, all now part of the health team. So we've expanded the idea of what the health team is. Uh, best practice guidelines really uh, place quite a lot of emphasis on cultural competence as an important, and, uh, and that's true for all, all patients we deal with, that uh, unless you understand their culture and are able to meet the culture, meet the culture, you won't get the best outcomes. So this is not about being politically correct. It's about getting the best outcomes for health. And uh, in health governance and health management, there's now quite a lot of expertise in DHBs in the ministry and in other organisations. Now, uh, I mentioned the health providers. In, in 1984, Rokura Hauora Tainui and the Whaioranga Trust were the two health providers, and uh, uh, Raiha Mahuta talked about one of them, the Tainui one, at the Hui Whakaoranga, and people were wondering with disbelief whether that could possibly ex continue. Would it be sustainable? And it wasn't for a long time because it was difficult to fund. But in 1993, when the health reforms came, that changed because the health reforms separated the funders from the providers and it meant that Māori could tender to provide health services. So that was a major change so that uh, by then, by 1998, there were more than 100 providers and that's continued to increase. So there are some uh, people who, who argue that a separate Māori organisation is a type of apartheid. Uh, 
uh, this, uh, that comment was raised recently in, re in relationship to Whanawara, which is a, a, a program set up, that it's, that it's racist and that it's uh, with apartheid. What is more racist and what is apartheid uh, disparities in health outcomes? And I think we've gone past the stage of recognising that there's only one route to get a good outcome. There are a number of options to get there, and that's what Māori health providers are looking at aiming for the same thing as every other health provider, good health, good health outcome, but a different way of getting there. So these are the gains then over, over this 30 year period I've been talking about. Uh, the population has increased, that's, uh, that's uh, good. Life expectancy has increased. Maori health perspectives are written in to practice. Much greater Maori health awareness by iwi, by Maori communities positive response from the health sector, and a strong Māori health workforce. Big changes. The question comes up as to what will the next 30 years look like, and will it continue to be a replay of the last 30 years, or are there other things that ought to be looked at? And uh, there's, there's quite a lot of discussion uh, looking at shifting not, not radically shifting, but shifting the focus and the balance. Uh, we we favour crisis intervention as a form of intervention, and that's important that you do we do resolve a crisis. But beyond a crisis, there is the need, I think, for health and social services and education to build capacity, so that sorting out the crisis is not an end point. What is the end point is being able to build capacity. If you're a diabetic nurse, man, diabetic nurse manager, getting your patient on the right medication with the right exercise and the right diet is really important. That'll prevent the crisis. Having the next, a next generation where diabetes type 2 doesn't occur is the ultimate aim. And that's about building capability. So there's a shift from dealing with the crisis to building capability. Yeah, the, the other question is that we've got uh, better and better at managing disease and quite a lot of Maori health providers and health providers generally focus on disease management and that's a good thing, don't, don't, uh, don't stop doing that. But at some point we've got to be able to be shifting the focus to the determinants of health. What are the causes of ill health? And is that something that health workers should be more, take, put more on their agenda than has been in the past? And is it enough to provide health care, or should we be providing health information with the care so that Farno became really literate in matters of health to the point that they know best how to manage their own health in time? So that's a shift from care, the shift of an emphasis on care to just balancing that a bit with the transfer of health information in ways that can be understood. And uh, health, uh, the health sector, like most sectors in New Zealand, education sector, um, social services, tend to develop their own programs. Uh, that needs to give way increasingly to the idea of a collaborative approach where the sectors interact, and they interact not just with each other, but with iwi and with communities. Uh, the, the, uh, as we heard from the, C, the CE, uh, Chris, earlier on, the real need to collaborate, which is moving away from a sector-oriented approach to healthcare to a collaborative approach. And uh, the focus on disadvantage and adversity, uh, it's good to know those things, but really the focus has got to be much more on what is the potential and what can be achieved. And then... Uh, this last 30 years, a lot of work done on introducing Māori models of health. Uh, that's good for providers. What we also need to talk about is introducing a kawa, a way of doing things, that can be relevant to families so that they have the kawa. So here's a possible strategy for the next 30 years. Uh, nearly into 30 years, I've put 2040 because that'll be an important point in New Zealand's history. Not all, not all of us will be there in 2040. 
Abraham, but we'll be thinking of him. The, uh, <laughs> but there's a, a, a strategy. We take account of the gains made in the last, the really substantial gains, so we need to have those on. That's the building block that we take forward. We try and look at what are the principles that will be important in the next 30 years. Whanawara, I think, has provided a useful model when it comes to this notion of intersectoral collaboration. Uh, we need to do, have a dual approach. We need to build protective factors on the one hand and minimise risk factors on the other, doing both of those things. We ought to have uh, much more emphasis on the determinants of health that are within the scope of the health sector. Recognise agents for change and how we refocus our teams. And then aim for what I'm calling a triple high level aim. We talk about the triple bottom line, shift that up to the triple upper aim, uh, to have uh, healthy individuals, healthy collectives, and a healthy environment. So this is what the framework might look like. Uh, a set of broad aims, some goals that are priority goals, change agents, that's mostly you guys, principles that should guide it, and the foundations. I've talked about the broad aims. Basically, they're these. Modi order, healthy lives. Every individual's life should be a healthy one. Whānau order, which is about healthy whānau, healthy families. And Wai order, which is about healthy environments. We need to think of those three at the same time. Uh, and they, we think of them at the same time because they are related. You can't have healthy individuals if the, if the family is not uh, healthy. You can't have a healthy environment if we don't contribute to a healthy environment. You can't have a healthy individual if the environment is not a healthy environment. These are the pr six principles that might be useful to think about in guiding us. Uh, the, the aim is Maori health gains. That's the aim. Uh, and that, that's, that's a principle. What we do has got to be delivered to produce gains. Uh, we need to affirm culture and heritage and world views because we've seen in the last 30 years that they are important to health. We need to look at uh, natural environments and man-made environments and be scanning them all the time to see where the risks are. How many alcohol outlets do you need in our community? How many fast food chains do you need in a community? How many discount tobacco shops do you need in a community? That's environmental scanning, as well as the quality of the water, the quality of the harbour. Uh, that, that's, that's environmental scanning. Need to alleviate poverty, uh, that poverty is the precursor of poor health, and the alleviation of poverty has got to be one of our really uh, important principles underlying this. Increase educational achievement and align policies and programs between us so that the policies and programs of the government match the policies and programs of iwi and of communities. DHBs and PHOs are on the same page. DHBs and uh, Ministry of Social Development on the same page. So there are six principles, Maori health gains, the affirmation of culture, natural and man-made environmental scanning, the alleviation of poverty, uh, increased educational achievement, and the alignment of policies, programs, and practices. And you could call those the Manaya principles. <laughs> <laughs> because they are already reflected in the work of the Manaya PHO. <laughs> the agents for change, who, who are the agents for change? Tomorrow's health team will probably look different from today's health team. Uh, the integrated services team will be different from what we have now. There are a number of community-inspired initiatives that will just develop out of communities that will act as catalysts for change, and we've already seen some of them, and that here we have a huge role to play in this transformation of health in the next 30 years. Tomorrow's health team... Uh, Reduce the, uh, the balance on health care by integrating treatment and care with health promotion and disease prevention. They tend to be isolated from each other, need really to be integrated. There is no health intervention 
which should be disassociated from health promotion and prevention of the, for the next generation at least. Uh, teams could change, they couldn't create, they already do in some areas, community leaders, nutritionists, exercise specialists, primary and secondary health care specialists, cultural experts, economic experts should be part of the health team. And teams should be really ready and able to collaborate with others in the community. And the, the, the broad goals of tomorrow's health teams are to ensure that the, what they do is aligned to what community aspirations are aligned to the broad strategies of Maori development. We shouldn't say health is one de development, Maori development is separate. They've got to be integrated as part of the same picture. Uh, they should be aligned to iwi strategies and plans and to wider health sector. The integrated uh, service team is, borrows a bit of the, the whānau order model, which is that economic, social, cultural expertise is available to us an integrated team, so people work, sectors work together. We haven't done that well in the past. That uh, contracts become integrated, and this is one of the hurdles for whānau ora, is integrating contracts, because if you've got health workers and social uh, service workers uh, coming together, each of them probably brings 12 or a dozen, uh, a dozen or more contracts. The effort is now to make that a single contract, and it's proving difficult. Uh, so there is a single contract. It's got 24 schedules attached to it. And the schedules look like the old contracts. <laughs> I think that's a transitional point. But in some way, we've got to be able to think how we can get through, uh, through that. And the other way is, how do you measure an outcome? And there is no single outcome measure. Uh, we need to be thinking about outcomes more broadly. A number of really inspirational things are already happening in communities that are transforming the lives and the health of Māori. Uh, Iron Māori, I don't know whether any of you have been involved in that, a spectacular event held in uh, December each year at Hastings. Uh, they uh, open it up for registrations in about July. Seven minutes after they open it, they close it because they are flooded. This, uh, last year, over 2,000 participants. And uh, a mix of people, some there to better the time that they had last year and prepare themselves for the Taupo Iron Mari, uh, Mari uh, Iron Man. Uh, some of them are there because they think they ought to do something because they, they're feeling a bit unfit. And some of them are there to save their lives, that they know if they don't do something, they don't have a life ahead of them. And it's been absolutely amazing uh, to see people participate who would never have dreamed of participating. A whole year's training, change of diet, change of attitude, we're far no working together because they have teams as well. So that's, I think, been a hugely important transformational catalyst that just arose out of the community. The same with Waka Ama. Uh, that, that's, uh, and Oahi Kori, that's increasingly uh, uh, catching on to, uh, to Māori. Uh, there are cultural events. Matatini Kapahaka is becoming quite a strong health programme. If you're going to win Kapahaka, you've got to have a good-looking front row. <laughs> <laughs> and so the front row, now the back row, I notice, is changing, and people are looking really fit because the, the, uh, the exercise, the items require high levels of fitness, and people take it seriously, train for two years to, to be part of it. And then in the learning area, there are some really good initiatives as well. Kohanga Reo, not a new initiative, but what it showed is that Māori will participate in early childhood education if the cultural signals are right. And that uh, we know enough about early childhood education to know that that is a precursor to good health in years to come. Uh, Hipuna Marama Trust, which is, uh, operates in Whangarei, has started the uh, A Company Academy and is about to launch a, one of New Zealand's first partnership schools, charter schools sometimes called, uh, Hikura Haurua, being launched, I think, in the, later this month. Principal's Nathan Matthews. And that'll be uh, innovative. And the idea of it is not just to have a Māori school, the idea is to transform Māori achievement at school. And so it'll be interesting to see how, how that emerges. 
Uh, Te Wānanga Roko was the first of the Wānanga to open, and that's transformative too, in, in so far as he gets people involved in tertiary education who never thought they would get involved in it. And there were other community efforts as well. So that many of the catalysts for change are actually evident already, and over the next 30 years, others, I'm sure, will emerge. Here we have a huge role to play in this transforming process. Uh, many we have, have had uh, good health programs, but delivering health care may not be the most important role for an iwi. An iwi uh, contribution to health may be much more by looking at the determinants of health, having a role in education. I talked about the charter school. There's another school being launched in Palmerston North on Friday. Oh, Saturday, a school being launched called Manukura, and it's got three aims, uh, excellence in uh, academic work, excellence in sport, and excellence in cultural appreciation. And small school, 80, 85 students, that's being launched. That's an iwi initiative, Ngāti Kaufata is the iwi, so they have the launch on the Aurangi Marae. Uh, there's a large number of uh, Māori organisations looking at the environment the natural environment, not so much the, the local environment, but need to focus increasingly on street environments because that's where most Māori live. So here we have a big role to play, but it may not be in delivering health services. These are the two, two big goals. Uh, how do you, uh, and sometimes you do one, sometimes you do the other. Build protective factors which guard against uh, illness and reduce risk factors that create illness. We know what the protective factors are, we know what the risk factors are, and I think over the next 30 years we've got to get better at demonstrating how we have managed those two particular goals. So you can put it all together and get a matrix, which won't be very interesting to you, <laughs> but, but just take an example, if this building protective factors, and aiming for these three broad go uh, aims, healthy lives, healthy whanau, healthy environments, uh, building protective factors, sport and exercise, we know, particularly if there's no alcohol involved, is a strong protective factor. Uh, health screening is a protective factor. Health literacy is a protective factor. Uh, clean air, water quality, green spaces, important for a healthy environment. So you can put those uh, goals alongside the aims and create a matrix out of it. Well, really just want to uh, conclude here by, by thanking Manaya uh, PHO for the opportunity uh, for us to come together. I was never, uh, never entirely sure what to talk about, Chris, <laughs> except that I knew it had something to do with health. And uh, uh, the, I, I guess the... Uh, this, as I said, would not have happened without Manaya Health contributing to this every year and setting it as part of the, world, of the nation's calendar. Just uh, then, this is the framework I've been talking about. Foundations built over the last 30 years, strong foundations, uh, and we've all contributed to those. Then we've got the uh, six Manaya principles, now embedded in your minds <laughs> with an acronym. We're looking now at establishing priority goals and looking for change agents, whether those change agents come from iwi or from communities or from expanded health teams or for sectors working together in order to realise these very broad aims that we've got of uh, Modi order, whānau order and wai order. So you've probably forgotten the slide, but... Uh, <laughs> I said at the beginning these were the main points that we wanted to talk about, just to reiterate them. 1984 was a pretty important year because of the three hui that were held that set in place the transformation of modern Māori society. And the hui whaka oranga, one of the three, signalled a new approach to Māori health. Since 1984 there have been substantial gains for Māori and they're measurable gains. The next 30 years will require different approaches not forgetting where we've come from, but building on what's been done in order to take the health message further. And those three board aims, will uh, that message will have been achieved 
if we can achieve these three aims of Māori ora, whānau ora, and uh, wai ora. Kia ora. Tēnā koe anō te rangatira ta Mason. Tēnā koe mō tō ako mō tō tōhu mō tō rangatira tanga. He mihi, he mihi. I think it's just important for us just to hold now what we've heard tonight, let it absorb within us. Um, we have been privileged to have in our midst a great leader, and a great teacher, and a great guide, and a man of great tika on pono on aroha. Ta Mason tonight rightly acknowledged the achievements of the last recent years and where we've come from, and that is heartening to us all, because that's um, fuel to keep us doing more. We were going to have present tonight um, Irama Henari to actually um, host and um, last minute Irama was called to Waitangi this evening and I noted his father uh, was on one of the um, slides of Sir Mason, um, uh, Sir James Henari, Ta Henari and he's well known in Taitokurao for this statement that we have done too much not to do more We've gone too far not to go further. And I think that's really the theme of tonight. We have done so much. But there's a challenge that has been laid down to us tonight with great clarity. A challenge to do more. To overcome that huge disparity in health outcomes that still exist. So uh, we pick up the challenge and we will continue to do more. It's very heartening to see, particularly in Taitokura, where we sit at the bottom, seemingly, so often of the health heap, um, to see that we are achieving, and we, and we know, those of us who live here and love here and work here know that, but we are. And um, it's very heartening to see the, the advances in the smoking cessation, which is so important for our future. So the health collective of Taitokura which we call an alliance, has come together and have one major, not trying to do everything, but one major significant goal that we have committed ourselves to. And that's in line with the 2025 smoke-free New Zealand, that this country will be smoke-free by 2025. Our goal is to become a smoke-free Te Tai in 2020. And we know that this will take a collective effort like we've never seen before across not just the whole health world but across the entire community and sector of Northland. So that's where we are going. That's where the different stars that I spoke about before are aligning. We're joined up now and committed ourselves not to try and do everything but to do a few significant things um, from a health world. We take on board very seriously the the framework that um, Tar Mason has placed before us. 
I think all of us now are going to absorb that and look at it. It's a framework that we can actually work on um, now very clearly. Uh, it's a, I'd asked, actually I'd asked um, Sir Mason to assist us with a, a signpost really for the next stage of the journey, knowing that we are on the journey, but what is the next stage? And um, thank you very much for giving us that tonight. Um, it's an immense gift to us and we will now collectively work on that. And we look forward to um, you coming back and returning to us and um, seeing where we've come from and then giving us another signpost. Uh, once again, uh, let's acknowledge uh, Tar Mason. I'd like to acknowledge Fire Ani Fox, our fire for Manaya Health who gives us so much guidance on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of um, living titiriti, tēnā uh, koe whaia, ki ora. And I just ask Fire to, on behalf of all of us here tonight, to um, give a very small token of our aroha and appreciation to, to Mason. And Fire, would you now please close the evening for us with a karakia uh, and final himene. Thank you.